Well, that's a great update. Uh, you just got 2,000 years of history in a <laughs> six or seven minute window. And that's one thing I really appreciate about what Shmulek brings to the tour is just um, that historical wisdom. And he has a passion for Herod, which uh, you don't get on a lot of tours because all we hear is the Herod who killed the babies. And we're like, why would he do such a horrible thing? And just to kind of get that background on his psyche and who he was. Now, you don't, don't even know this yet, Shmulek, but you're actually quoted in my new book, Story in the Stars, but I gave you no credit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, How lovely. Yes, I talk about uh, the unwise men. I said, like my friend in Israel says, the unwise men who came to Herod. I actually stole your line. So we're going to edit that out of the video because I don't want anybody to know you're smart. <laughs> uh, so this is our first, we're beginning our first full day here in Israel. And yesterday, you know, we had that quick stop, remember down in Jaffa? And so it was a bit of a drive from Jaffa over to, to the hotel. We spent a beautiful day at the hotel and the beach. And this morning we got on the bus and we drove another 45, 50 minutes away from there. And the whole time we were going, we were just driving parallel north with, with the coast, with the, uh, the Mediterranean. And so I hope you kind of put in your mind a little bit the distance of where Cornelius, the man who lives here in, in Caesarea, he's a Roman soldier. You just heard all about the Roman Empire and their power on this region, so we know that he's living and working for a kingdom that's not for the Jews. They're really against the Jews. But yet the Bible says that he was a God-fearing man. He was basically a Gentile who had embraced the, the Jewish faith. It says that he prayed several times a day and that God heard his prayer. So instead of just kind of, uh, you know, uh, lowballing or just guessing at what they're saying. Let, let me kind of read to you the story in Acts chapter 10. And this is one of my favorite things to do when I come to Israel, is to read a story in the location where it actually took place. I don't care how nice your church is. I have a nice church too. It doesn't matter. There's nothing like being in a theater built by King Herod in the city that we're about to read in Acts chapter 10. That's cool. Yeah. That's something you can't get anywhere else on the world. And so I love to do it as much as we can, read on location where the story took place. So if you want to follow along or you can just listen in to Acts chapter 10. It says that in Caesarea. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Here, there lived a man. Right? When you go home and you read the story again, or you hear a pastor preach on it, or if you're a pastor and you're preaching on it, you'll be like, oh my goodness, I remember the moment where I, where I was standing there. So here in Caesarea, there lived a Roman officer named Cornelius, and he was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man. That basically means a, gen a yeah, Gentile who had embraced the Jewish faith. When the Bible says that Joseph, the father of Jesus on the earth, was a God-fearing man, that's the way of saying that he was a devout Orthodox Jew living in the time. So when you hear they were God-fearing, it meant they, they, they were kosher, they were Sabbath observant, they gave their alms, they went to the temple to pray, they did all, all their Bible reading. That's what it's telling us about Cornelius. Because the, the Italians, the Romans of that time, worshipped every god but the God of Israel. And so to have a man in one of the, the mega centers, epicenters of the Roman Empire to be serving the God of Israel, that's actually, it's a huge deal. It's not brought out, but it really is a huge deal. So one afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming towards him. Cornelius, the angel said. Um, Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send to men, send men to Jaffa, or Jaffa, and summon a man named Simon Peter, He's staying with Simon a tanner who lives near the seashore. And as soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants, he told them what had happened, and then he sent them off to Jaffa. And you read it, and the next line is, and so there, there they were in Jaffa. Hang on a second. <laughs> they weren't just there. They took the whole, it would have been like a whole day from, from morning until night. You'll read about Jesus being in, the, in Nazareth, and then the next line is, and so then he was in Jerusalem. Six days later, he was in Jerusalem. They don't tell you the topography or geography. So just as we're here, just begin to get a lay of the land. And so the next day, uh, Cornelius' messengers were, were nearing the town. Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. Shmuel talked about this yesterday as a smell was up on the roof. And the Bible says he was hungry too. 
So interesting that God uses food, what's already in his mind and in his stomach, <laughs> to be able to, to speak to him. Um, so Peter went up on the roof to pray. It was about noon and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance or he fell into a vision. And he saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. And in the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles and birds. And a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared, I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. God's preparing Peter for what he's going to do in the Gentiles. And he says, you know, kill these unclean animals and eat them. Peter's like, tell me you're kidding, God. I've devoted my life to serving you and following your word and not eat these things. And I've been abstaining from them. And you're saying to eat? No way, this isn't you speaking to me. And Peter is called St. Peter later on in history, but he's not so saintly in the beginning of his ministry. He's very, very thick-headed because three times the vision has to come to him. Three times Jesus has to say, do you love me? Three times he denies Jesus. You see, three times a lot happens in the life of Peter. So three times it happens. And um, so Peter was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? And then the next words, just then. The men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house standing outside the gates. And so they have a conversation with Peter and they tell him, our master had this vision and we were told to come here and get you. And what does it say here? It says, um, so, so Peter uh, invited the men to stay for the night and the next day they went, they went with him and they arrived at Jaffa. As Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshiped him, but Peter replied, get up. I'm just a human like you. So they walked together and went inside. And here's here's the part. So often people interpret what happened there in um, Jaffa as a means for the abolishment of food laws. Now, I'm not saying it is or it isn't. There's no judgment on what you eat. Actually, the Bible says don't let anybody judge you on matters of food and drink. Sabbath day, feast days, rest days, holy days. Don't let anyone judge you. So it's not about whether it's wrong or right to do. It's whether or not this passage is saying that or not. And so as he's having the vision, he says, just then two men appeared. And now Peter really gives the answer. He says in verse 28, you know it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me. When did God show him? In the vision the day before. That I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So it wasn't about food. God used food as an illustration. All your life you've been told that these things are unclean. He says, I'm saying they're clean. But the bigger picture, he's talking about the people. All your life you thought you were the only clean one. You thought you, you were the only ones on my agenda, the only ones that I even knew existed. But that's, that's not true at all. I've been preparing. I've been working in the background. So don't call anyone, not anything now, don't call anyone unclean. Because he says to Cornelius, normally I wouldn't come into your house, but God just showed me. I thought you were unclean, but he says you're not anymore. You're clean because of what his son has done for you. And that really, to me, is the beginning of the church. We start to see Jew and Gentile coming together in faith in Christ. Because the Jews were the ones who were looking for the Messiah. Judaism was the only one that were looking for a Messiah. All these other religions served all these other gods. They weren't looking. And so Peter never thought in his life that a Gentile would want to know anything about his Jewish God, about his Jewish Messiah. Boy, he was surprised. In fact, Peter fought it so hard that he decided not to go to the Gentiles. Remember who had to stand up? Paul. Peter said, I can go to the Jews. I'll do that all day long, but I can't. I can't do it. I just, I, just, I can't. I'm sure it's you, but I'm not your guy. And Paul says, I'll do it. And he steps in. And because he steps in, in part anyways, is why we're here in Caesarea today. Because we've been afforded the opportunity to, to hear the gospel. So this is what I want to say. And the preacher me is trying to be mindful of your time. And I'm about to say, and with the story I close, which is a lie, by the way, so pastor's <laughs> saying, when they're thinking about what they want to say next. <laughs> But in closing, seriously, here, here's what really struck me last night as I was going over the story again. Here's Cornelius, this Gentile, living here in Caesarea. 
and he's praying to this God that he now believes as the God. And every day it says he prays. Three times a day he's praying, he's praying, no answer, no angels, nothing supernatural, nothing amazing, just the mundane. One day, his faithfulness pays off. He's giving his alms, he's paying his tithes, he's giving to the poor, he's reading his Bible, he's praying to his God every day and nothing, nothing. And just when he thought nothing was going to happen, something happened. And for some of you, that's even why you're here today. You've been praying about coming to Israel, you've been asking God, oh, I'd love to go to Israel, and you're praying and you're wishing and you're hoping and you're believing. And it happened. You're here. And maybe back home there's something that's going on. And we're here and we're, we're confronted with all this amazing stuff. But back home maybe there's still something going on. And you've been praying into it. You've been thinking into it. Asking God. Let me just encourage you. Be like Cornelius. Even though you don't see the results immediately and maybe not in the time you want. Just be faithful. Be a God-fearing man or a God-fearing woman. And just keep pushing. Just keep believing as the sun says and one day at the right day at the right time God will give you the direction that you're seeking. Amen? Amen. Amen.